Show Business by William Boyd. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Show Business by William Boyd. Recording by Timothy Casey. Except for old Dworkin, Kotha's bar was deserted when I dropped in shortly after midnight. The ship from Earth was still two days away, and the Martian flagship would get in next morning with 700 passengers for Earth on it. Dworkin must have been waiting in Luna City a whole week, at 6,000 credits a day. That's as steep to me as it is to you, but money never seemed to worry Dworkin. He raised the heavy green lids from his protruding brown eyes as I came in. He waved his tail. Sit down and join me, he invited in his guttural voice. It is not good for a man to drink alone, but I have no company in dis by de God's deserted hole. A man must something be doing, what? I sat down in the booth across from my Venusian friend and stared at him while he punched a new order into the drink board. For me, another chic, he announced, and for you, de same? Against my better judgment, for I knew I'd have plenty to do handling that mob of tourists, the first crowd of the season is always the roughest, tomorrow. I consented. Dworkin had already consumed six of the explosive things, as the empty glasses on the table showed, but he exhibited no effect. I made a mental note, as I'd often done before, that this time I would not exceed the safe terrestrial limit of two. You must be in the money again, drinking imported chic, I remarked. What are you doing in Luna City this time? He merely lifted his heavy eyelids and stared at me without expression. Nah, in de money I am not. There are too many chiselers in the business. Just when I think I have a good thing going, I am swindled. It is too bad. He snorted through his ugly snout, making the Venusian equivalent of a sigh. I knew there was a story waiting behind that warty skin, but I was not sure I wanted to hear it, for the next round of drinks would be on me, and Schick was a hundred and fifty credits a shot. Still, a man on a moon assignment has to amuse himself somehow. So I said, What's in the latest episode of the Dworkin soap opera? What is the merchandise this time? Gems? Pet Mercurian fire insect? A new supply of Denga? I do not smuggle drugs. That is a base lie, replied my friend stolidly. He knew, of course, that I still suspected him to be the source of that last load of that potent narcotic, although I had no more proof than did the Planetary Bureau of Investigation. He took a long pull at his drink before he spoke again. But Dworkin is never down for long. This time it is show business. You remember how I have always been by the theater so fascinated. Well, I decided to open a show here in Luna City. Think of all the travelers, bored stiff by space and the emptiness thereof, who pass through here and during the season. Even if only half of them go to my show, it cannot fail. I waited for some mention of free tickets, but none was made. I was about as anxious to see Dworkin's show as I was to walk barefoot across Mare Imbrium. But I asked with what enthusiasm I could force. What sort of act are you putting on? Girls? I shuddered as I recalled the pathetic shop-worn chorus girls that Sam Lowe had tried to pass off last year on the gullible tourists of the spaceways. That show had lasted ten nights, nine more than it deserved. There are limits, even to the gullibility of earth lovers. Yes, girls, replied Dworkin, but not perhaps what you are thinking. Martian girls. This was more interesting. Even if the girls were now a little too old for the stage in the Martian capital, they would still get loud cheers on the moon. I knew. I started to say so, but Dworkin interrupted. And not the miserable girls they buy from the slave traders in Bestin. These girls I collected myself from the country along the upper canal. I repressed my impulse to show my curiosity. It could all be perfectly true, and if it were not the opening night would tell but it sounded a lot like one of Dworkin's taller tales. I'd never been able to disprove any one of them, but I found it a little hard to believe that so many improbable things had ever happened to one man. However, I like being entertained, if it doesn't cost me too much. So finally I said, 
I suppose you are going to tell me you ventured out into the interior of Mars, carrying a six-week supply of water and oxygen on your back, and visited the zoo theaters on the spot. How did you know? That is just what I did, solemnly affirmed my companion. He snorted again and looked at his glass. It was empty, but he tilted it into his face again in an eloquent gesture. No words were needed. I punched the symbols for Schick in my drink board on my side of the table. Then, after hesitating, I punched the two in signal. I must remember, though, that this was my second and last. His eighth Schick seemed to instill some animation into Dworkin. I know you feel skeptically, I mean skepticism, after my exploits. You will see tomorrow night that I speak true. Amazing, I said, especially as I just happen to remember that three different expeditions from Earth tried to penetrate more than a hundred kilometers from Beshtin, but either they couldn't carry the water and oxygen that far, or they resorted to breathing Mars air and never came back. And they were Earthmen, not Venusians, who are accustomed to two atmospheres of carbon dioxide. My friend, you must not reason. It was so. It always will be so. The principle of induction is long exploded. I did indeed breathe Mars air. Wait, I tell you how. He took another long swig of schick. That your Earthmen did not realize was that they cannot acclimate themselves as do we Venusians. You know the character of our planet made adaptability a condition of survival. It is true that our atmosphere is heavy, but on top of our so high mountains the air is thin. We must live everywhere. The space is so few. I first adapted myself on earth to live. I was there a whole year, you will recollect. Then I go further. Your engineers construct air tanks that make air like the air of the mountains. Then, so I learned to live in those tanks. Each day I have spent one, two, three hours in them. I get so I can breathe air at one-third the pressure of your already thin atmosphere, and at one-sixth the tension of oxygen. No, my friend, you could not do this. Your lungs burst, but old Dworkin, he has done it. I take with me only some water, for I know the Martians dare not give water. To trade, some miniature kerosene lamps. You know they got no fuel oil now, only atomic, but these little lamps stay like for antiques, for sentiment, because their great-grandfathers used them. Well, I walk through Velas and not stop. Too close by the capital. Too much contact with men of other planets. I walk also through Burr and Zamat. I come to a small place where they never see foreigner. Name Tasaha. Oh, I tell you, the men of the other planets do not know Mars. How delightful, how unspoiled are the Martians. Once you get away from the people by tourists so spoiled, how wonderful. Across the sand to go. Free as birds, the soul friendly greetings of the Martian men and the Martian women. Ah. Well, in Tasaha, I go to theater. Such lovely girls, you shall see. But I saw something else. That, my friend, you hardly believe. Dworkin looked down at his empty glass and snorted gently. I took the hint. Although for myself I ordered the less lethal Martian. Azadni. I was already having difficult believing parts of his narrative. It would be interesting to see if the rest were any harder. My companion continued. They not only have the chorus, which you have seen on Earth, imported from Mars, and such a chorus, such girls, but they have something else. You recall your terrestrial history? Once your ancestors had performers on the stage who did funny motions and said amusing remarks. The spectators make to laugh. I think you call it vaudeville. Well, on Mars they also have vaudeville. He paused and looked at me from under half-shut eyelids and grinned widely to show his reptilian teeth. I wondered if he really found something new. I would even be willing to pay for a glimpse of Martian vaudeville. I wondered if my Martian was too rusty for me to understand jokes in the spoken lingo. They have not only men and women telling jokes, they have trained animals acting funny, Dworkin went on. This was too much. 
I suppose the animals talked too, I said sarcastically. Do they speak Earth or Martian? He regarded me approvingly. My friend, you catch on quick. He raised a paw. Now don't at conclusions jump. Let me explain. At first, I did not believe it either. They sprang it with no warning. Onto the stage came a pool. You know him, I think. And a shioclid. The shioclid was riding a bicycle. I mean, a monocle. One wheel. The tlul moved just as awkward as he always does, and then tried to ride a tandem four-wheeled vehicle, which had been especially made for him. In spite of my resolve, I chuckled. The picture of a tlul trying to ride a four-wheeled bicycle, pumping each of his eight three-jointed legs up and down in turn, while maintaining his usual supercilious and indifferent facial expression, was irresistibly funny. Wait, said my friend, and again raised a paw. You have as yet nothing heard. They make jokes at the same time. The shuklid asked the tlu, who was that tlu I saw you with up on the canal? And the tlu replies, that was no tlu, that was my steep. I doubled up laughing. Unless you have visited Mars, this may not strike you as funny, but I collapsed into a heap, put my head on the table, and wept with mirth. It seemed like five minutes before I was able to speak. Oh, no. Yes, yes, I tell you, yes, insisted my friend. He even smiled himself. If you don't know the social system of the Martians, there is no point in me trying to explain the idea of a tools being out with the neuter of neuters, a sky as so devastatingly funny, but that suddenly was not quite the point. Did it happen? I had large doubts. Nobody had ever heard a tool make any sort of sound, and it was generally supposed that they had no vocal cords, and no Euclid, they sometimes resemble a big groundhog, and live in burrows along the canals of Mars, had ever been heard to make a noise except a high-pitched whistle when frightened. Now just a minute, Dworkin, I said. You know, my friend, I know, you think it is impossible, you think the talking is faked. So I thought too, but wait. It seems Dworkin had inquired among the audience as to who owned the performing animals. The local Martians were not as impressed as he was with the performance, but they guided him to the proprietor of the trained animal act. He was a young Martian, hawk-nosed, with flashing black eyes, dusky skin, and curly hair. So I say to him, this Martian, Dworkin continued, if your act on the level is, I buy. I had three small diamonds with, he explained. But the Martian was hard to deal with. First, he said he would not sell his so valuable and so beloved animals. The only talking animals on Mars, he said. The liar. At long last, I get him to make a price. But on condition that he brings the animals around to my inn in the morning for a private audition. I suppose, I interrupted, you are beginning to have some doubts as to the Martian's good faith. After all, a talking tool and a talking shioklid all at one time is quite a lot to ask, I would have. Please, friend, please, interrupted my companion. Do you not think of Dworkin knows these things? Of course he does. I think. The owner, he is pulling a fake, I guess. I know that animals do not really talk. Next morning, I think he no show up, but no, I am mistaken. Promptly at nine o'clock, he come to my inn with a little dog cart with the animals. He put them on the stage in the bar of the inn. They act like before, but they didn't talk, of course. Oh, my friend, that's where you are wrong. They talk like nobody's business. The jokes are funnier than ever, even dirtier, maybe. But Dworkin is not fooled. He think, aha, I say to the Martian. You fake this, what? The animals not talk. Suppose you have them do the act while you stay outside, what? Then I think I have him. The Martian tear his curly hair, flash his black eyes. He take insult that I think he is fake. Name of the Martian gods, he cry. But at last he agrees to go away and tell the animals to go ahead. Dworkin, you were a sap to string along with him even as far as that, I said wearily. I hope you hadn't paid the guy any money. He shook his head. No, my old and best, he said. Dworkin no fool is, even on Mars. No, no money, but wait. The animals go on without the owner. Same stage business, same talk, same jokes, and even funnier yet. What? 
I stared at Dwokin. He did not smile, but finished off the eleventh sheik, the fifth I had bought him. Listen, I said, are you sitting there telling me you have a tool and a shioklid that can really talk? You listen, my friend. Like you, I think something is wrong. I say to the Martian owner, my friend, maybe I buy your act if you tell me how it is done. But you know as well as I do that it is impossible that these animals do talk. Tell me, what is the trick? Dworkin lifted his glass and shook it as though he could not believe it was empty, then looked at me questioningly. I shook my head. He snorted, looked melancholy, rised up from his chair and reached for his fur cape. Well, thanks for the drinks, he said. A dark suspicion crept into my mind, but I could not restrain myself. Wait, Dworkin, I shouted. You can't just leave me up in the air like that. What happened then? Dworkin snorted into his green handkerchief. The Martian admitted it was a fake after all, he said mournfully. Can you imagine it? What a chiseler. The Shoklet, he said, can't really talk. The Tool just throws his voice. End of Show Business by William Boyd Recording by Timothy Casey, Modesto, California